Um, okay, so just to say a few words on, on behalf of UK Society for Cooperative Studies, we're happy to welcome you. And I'm also acting as the host for the, the Fair Shares Institute is the organizer of these conference. That's my university role. Um, so I say very little other than to remind people that um, when you signed up that you gave permission for us to use any video or, or, or articulated contributions. So if you don't want to be recorded during the um, opening plenary and the feedback and closing sort of plenary, then uh, do switch off your video and remember that anything you put in chat will be saved as well. So um, that's part of the record of the meeting. When we go into breakout rooms, you won't be recorded. So you're completely free to discuss whatever you like in the breakout rooms. The facilitators and the panelists won't join you in the breakout rooms. They'll, they'll form a breakout group of their own, uh, which we will record and will be part of, of the record thereafter. So let me hand over to Nicole, who is our facilitator yes. today. Yes, hello everybody. I'm glad to see all of you for our um, interesting session on learning for new cooperativism. My name is Nicole von Guder and I come from Frankfurt University of Applied Sciences. <clears throat> I have been a member in various net research networks on cooperatives and social enterprises over the years. Um, my role here today is perhaps because uh, we had an intensive evaluative research on pupils cooperatives in Germany for a long time. And so I feel particularly for this issue. Okay. We have three renowned uh, panelists today from Poland, uh, Italy, and um, Europe stroke Africa. <laughs> they will hopefully give us a little insight into who they are, what they um, are doing, and they are concepts for um, improving learning of um, for new cooperativism. Um, each one of them will give us a statement of about three, four minutes. And then there will be a few interview questions, which we will actually hear and listen to in the plenary. After that, you will be going into breakout sessions for about 20 minutes with the purpose of generating your questions, questions that you want to have discussed in the next plenary. After the 20 minutes, Rory will bring you back into the plenary and we will be discussing your questions. So make quite sure that you have um, either a sequence of questions, uh, how you want to bring in your questions into the plenary, or that you have one spokesperson from your breakout group that poses the questions. We will then hope that the panelists will um, discuss and maybe there will be um, contradictory views. There might be um, special information questions that you bring in. Everything goes. Um, uh, we will have uh, um, uh, an attitude towards each other, which is constructive, because as you well know, the seminars are being recorded so that there will be um, a book in the end covering uh, the 10 subjects, the 10 topics on new cooperativism, so that we can actually disseminate experiences that come from different countries, but also critical questions, critical answers as to are we really on a way to a new cooperativism, or is this just a new word for something practiced for a long time? So um, please feel free to bring in all your comments and all your um, views in the last uh, part of our seminar, which is our reflective session. We will probably end towards 1800 hours um, Central European time or 1700 hours European um, uh, uh, British UK time. And wherever you are, I don't know what your time uh, zone is, so I hope we will um, satisfy your interests within the next 90 minutes. To start off with, may I ask Joanna to introduce herself briefly and to also let us share her experience in the cooperative learning. Yes, just a moment. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for inviting us to and, and give us the opportunity to share this um, experience. Uh, I've prepared uh, just a few slides for you to maybe um, uh, 
get the knowledge about our experiences in a more smooth way. <laughs> so I represent the National Auditing Union of, Co uh, of Cooperati uh, Cooperatives. It's a voluntary and self-governing organization that was established exactly 30 years ago. We are just having a, our anniversary. Uh, we associate mainly workers' cooperatives, and even until January this year, we were called National Auditing Union of Workers' Cooperatives. But just now, and somehow connected with the new cooperativism, we have changed the name uh, and opened ourselves to new forms of cooperatives, because there are new types of cooperatives emerging, and uh, actually they don't fit into any other branch uh, that was well traditionally called in Poland. So that's why, and, and we are also an organization that works very much with different non-governmental organizations, with uh, local authorities, with government, um, trying to promote the cooperative model. Uh, and this is why they actually um, come to us to, um, to cooperate, to, uh, to do different things together. That's why we open ourselves to new forms of cooperatives. Uh, well, in, among our aims, one of the most important ones is, of course, education. And we look at the education in three different dimensions. First, of course, it's education of personnel, uh, of personnel of cooperatives, uh, in order to help them to run their businesses uh, in a more professional way so that they can achieve their uh, economic and social goals. Of course, it's also education of young people about cooperatives as a way of doing business. Uh, so in this context, we cooperate with the universities um, where we try to introduce the cooperative enterprises into the university curricula so that the students get the knowledge about the possibility of choosing that kind of, uh, uh, of business entity. And last but not least, uh, we believe uh, very much that the learning by doing approach brings the best results. And that's why we feel that the approach that we should uh, teach about cooperatives, but through the cooperatives, it's, uh, it's really the best way to, to, um, to promote the cooperative model. And this is why we, for many years now, we um, support the pupils cooperatives uh, uh, that have a very long tradition in Poland because the first one was established over 120 years ago. So it's a very long tradition. Uh, pupils cooperatives, uh, they are established at schools. Their members are, are only pupils, only young people. Uh, but they, of course, are um, under the care of a teacher that is devoted to support them by the dire director of the school. And even we call him a caretaker. So he helps, supports, he leads uh, the group of young people in their cooperative uh, um, way. And the statistics says that now in Poland, we have around 700 cooperatives all around Poland. But some years ago, we were talking about even five of, or 6,000 of that kind of entities. And such a big decrease of the, of the amount of populist cooperatives is, uh, is totally connected with the fact that we are still lacking a legal regulation concerning that kind of activity. So this is one of the things that we are very much fighting for as a union, together with the, the foundation that supports that kind of uh, school uh, entities. I will stop now. I know I'm out of time. Thank you very much. I'm Feel free to ask all the questions there and share your views. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jana. That was a really hard task, three minutes for uh, introducing yourself and your organization and the concepts. But don't worry, we will have time to come back to uh, specific parts of it. Sarah, would you like to continue, please? Yeah, I yeah. am. Thank you very much. Let me share. Okay. Good. So, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to share the Around the World of Cook perspective in terms of learning. Um, everything I would like to start from a very simple question. That is how 
uh, have helped contribute to improving members' well-being and transforming their communities. And when we asked ourselves a few years ago this question, actually, we were meaning those uh, uh, new cooperatives that you uh, mentioned. So those cops that are really uh, inspired by cops values and uh, principles. And um, I mean, we were facing at that time, uh, I was facing in my work as a participatory action researcher, but also as a citizen, the, the fact that uh, too often we face misconception about cops. And uh, particularly what uh, concerns us is that media uh, um, I mean, talk about cooperatives only when there is some bad happening. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you can find, I don't know if you share this thing, but you can find news on the first page of newspapers, but too often only on that uh, situation. While we were asking us how could we could, uh, in a way, um, propose an approach that can foster easily mutual learning and uh, innovation um, in a cop to cop approach, um, and so that was the moment that we decided to engage in this around the world trip uh, with the purpose of catching the essence of cooperatives, of this new cooperativism. So not only focusing on, on uh, what cooperatives were doing, but particularly on COP identity. That was the approach. So really on uh, uh, the uh, idea and the motivation of cooperators. So with the International Cooperative Alliance, we, uh, in partnership, we carry out this trip around the world um, that I mean, uh, in 2019, also part of 2020. Um, but I mean, at the heart of this, actually, I would like to just a few words about our methodology, because it's this combination of participatory action research and video making, where uh, cooperators uh, are at the heart of the uh, story uh, building. So uh, they engage in activity that is, first of all, uh, a mutual learning among themselves about uh, uh, they cop endeavor, they cop story, and then uh, then we all together come up with a, with a video. Um, we continue, of course, we started as a two person. Now we are a group that we are incubated in a smart doc that I guess you all know. Um, and our mission is to transform research findings. So what we are usually in the academic community, um, we usually see in a paper uh, to transform them into a video so that uh, the inspiring findings, evidence-based stories, can reach a wider audience. So not only the academic community, but uh, also and above all citizenship communities. Um, so to be engaged into um, and be inspired by those stories. Um, so we could identify two levels in a way of impact. One is at the COP level, the cooperative engage in this process of storytelling. Uh, because it's an opportunity of mutual learning and of strengthening the COP identity. Um, it's, I mean, the story I actually, um, we documented a Polish COP story, uh, exactly one of those cooperatives that uh, are not uh, recognized as cooperative. And at the end of the of this uh, process was very interesting for them to say, wow, we have done all this, no? So it's a really a kind of learning about their own experience. And, um, and of course, then, uh, for us, this is a, a tool, a means that we are using, but we know that other organizations too are using to inspire youth and uh, other communities. So learning directly from uh, others' uh, experiences. So I think, uh, I mean- Go ...and has, uh, has substantial experience in entrepreneurship education um, and learning, as well as the evaluation component of it. So our objective in ECOOP, um, was to identify a set of um, high school programs and a set of university programs um, that could serve as illustrations of good practice, right? Of, uh, of what is a successful learning program. And we encountered um, many very impressive and innovative programs across Europe and ultimately selected seven uh, university programs and six high school programs to be featured in our ECOOP good practice guide. Um, and these programs uh, varied widely um, in format. Um, some were um, long-term programs spanning an entire master program. Some were uh, very short programs of only three days. Um, and what they all had in common was that they raise awareness of the um, cooperative alternative to learners that otherwise would um, possibly never have been exposed um, to a co-op. Um, also, um, most had a uh, practical component, um, and that ranged from internships in existing co-ops 
um, to students simulating model co-ops, going all the way to students um, creating actual student co-ops. Um, and of course, internships was uh, something we only saw in university programs, uh, not so much in high schools. Um, but, um, but where you have them, uh, they can be a great way for students to be exposed to the co-op setting. And of course, also for the co-ops to benefit um, from the work that the students are putting into the cooperative. And very importantly, also the fresh ideas that uh, might come from uh, having an intern. So it really goes, uh, it really goes both ways in terms of uh, the advantages. Um, we also found that um, many of the, the good practices in university programs have uh, a research component. And also what stood out there was uh, that these research components have a strong practical um, action-oriented component. Uh, so it's not just about researching um, papers that have been published about the subject, but rather it's about also students going into actual co-ops and interact uh, actively with them, for instance, through in-depth interviews uh, to learn something. Um, but no program is alike. There are many good ones. No program is alike. There's also no one size fits all approach in terms of what constitutes good practice. Um, well, and um, developing and running a learning program is, um, well, let's say, very hard work. Um, this is what we took away from it. And uh, from our conversations with the program leaders, uh, very hard work that they do. Um, and we hope that um, through our work on identifying good practices and sharing them uh, in UCOOP, we hope that we really came up with some inspiring examples uh, that can be used as a reference uh, for improvement in the future. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, so we have three various approaches, different approaches to looking at uh, cooperative learning. Um, what unites us in our discussion is that we want to look at the practices, the concepts that are being used in regard to in how far do they actually promote a new type of cooperativism. And with that, of course, we mean uh, what Joanna has illustrated right at the beginning that there were sectors of cooperatives uh, established in most countries, there was a firm law, that there was registration, that there was auditing, etc. And now we find that initiatives from the bottom have um, developed which don't fit these categories, which might actually edge on to the law, which might actually be difficult to audit, which um, perhaps aren't even registered as cooperatives. And this is a movement that, that probably is inspired by new values. We, we put this as a hypothesis, as it were, and from the angle of learning, we would like to find out today um, in how far these programs that, that you have um, either studied or uh, are instrumental in, um, are actually doing certain things to reach these. Um, has uh, Nicole gone silent for the rest of you? Yeah. I was not able to understand. At some point it cut off. Right. Um, let's just give her a moment and see if it comes back. Right. Nicole, you're back. You, you went off for about 30 ah. seconds there. Oh, shame, shame. Um, so I'd repeat my question, because we're looking at this new phenomenon of new cooperativism, we want to find out in which regard um, learning concepts are actually contributing to new types of values that seem to be a part of this new movement. Um, my first question to the panelists, therefore, would be in which regard do you think the approaches that you have to do with further workplace democracy? Please uh, just talk. It's only the Shall we answer you... straight away. Yes, yes, yeah. please. So I will uh, I will start start with the point that um, these new types of cooperatives that uh, are emerging in Poland, for instance. Mm, well, it started actually, and it was totally connected with the new cooperativism. I mean, this there there was a movement of food cooperatives that started in two thousand and ten, it and it was actually the first after many, many years, the first moment, moment when the solidarity, trust, responsibility, values connected with the cooperative movement 
emerge in a such a way that people really gathered together and they wanted to do something. But at that moment, they used uh, they were more like informal groups, and most of the cooperative food cooperatives in Poland still are. So if they used any legal entity, they used associations like a you know very I would say mild and a legal entity, not a cooperative, because in cooperative in Poland it's strictly a, an enterprise. So if you create a cooperative, you create an enterprise. So they chose to to use an association um, and then maybe make a step for, forward. I mean, take a next step. Like there is a food cooperative uh, Dobrze in, uh, in, in Warsaw that uh, already runs two shops in, Krak in, in Warsaw, in Krakow, hopefully. <laughs> um, but, uh, but they are like, you know, they are developing slowly. But for last years, we see the uh, the situation where new groups of people involved and uh, I would say uh, willing to really introduce cooperative values into the reality. They really choose the legal entity cooperative enterprise that is possible in Poland according to the law but the law is from 1982. So as you can uh, remember, it's before the uh, economical and political transformation. So many of the, uh, of the I would say, uh, regulations there are not very modern. So now we have a huge challenge because on one hand, on the one hand, they choose the, uh, the cooperative enterprise model. They create a real cooperative these cooperatives they do not fit any of of the you know current branches because it they are totally new ones so they run business but the challenge is to make a legal change so that the real cooperative law can be much more modern and be uh, and that's much easier for them to run business and that's one point mm -hmm. But the second point is that they need exactly the same skills when it comes to run a business like the, those who already run cooperatives for five, 50 years. So um, that's one thing. But the other thing is that, uh, and this is exactly the Pupius cooperatives, uh, what, what create Pupius co cooperatives. Uh, I must here recall a um, definition of a competence that says that its components are not only skills and knowledge, but also attitudes. And attitude is something that we um, actually get in the process, in let's say ingrained in the process of learning. But this is like a personal uh, experience. And this is exactly what pupils cooperatives give to students and to pupils, because at school, they run a real business. Okay, the market is only it's mm. only the uh, the school, but the mm -hmm. values, the principles are exactly the same. Mm. So we, we feel. Yeah. Jenna, like, Jenna, just Jenna, last I think, sentence. Yeah. Last mm -hmm. sentence. I promise, I will stop. <laughs> so we feel like we create people. We create new cooperators that when they finish schools and universities, they will be able to, uh, to run their businesses in a cooperative way. Right. I would, like to, mm -hmm. I would like to give the other two panelists just a brief yeah. opportunity Sorry. because Rory has restricted us to 10 minutes here. So, uh, Sarah, I, yes. how I'm about... Very happy, I'm very happy to contribute now, right after Joanna, because uh, these things doesn't happen by chance. Uh, yes. But uh, honestly, let's inform everyone that was not prepared. But one of the cop stories that we documented is exactly the Dobje cop. So we have been with them uh, in uh, September last year. We had a fantastic time. We spent fantastic time with them. And exactly one of the stories. So I will now in a second uh, uh, copy in the chat uh, uh, the, the video story uh, that they prepared no, according to this methodology. So yes. they decided how to develop their own story. So watching 15 minute video, uh, it's like uh, visiting them and spending time with them. Um, yeah. And uh, so to go back to the question of uh, uh, Nicole, but exactly 
this uh, um, a bit our approach exactly identifying uh, co-ops that uh, all the story actually have a, have a common ground that they started informal so they started as a process of uh, um, collective action uh, in a bottom-up way uh, where people identify the common needs and according to around that common needs they develop the organization and then step by step perhaps uh, they uh, structure it and became a formal uh, register uh, cooperative but uh, um, it, this is exactly what we were looking for in these stories insights about this uh, how important is this glue of a shared common vision then to set up and uh, develop uh, a sustainable business so really uh, focusing on the fact that the two dimension of being an association of being an enterprise are in balance and when they are in balance they can move forward so all these stories have, i would say that have this uh, common ground um and uh, i can also share with jo joanna one of the story uh, in line with what joanna was saying one of the story about uh, a school cop um in uh, malaysia this time that they have a very well developed system about yeah. that that perhaps we might say that when we went there, we were a bit, uh, um, you know, uh, surprised to see that perhaps the first principle was not really fully implemented in the sense that uh, each school has to develop this COP school. But uh, it was fantastic to see students reporting while developing their own video that say as a main achievement for them that whoever know what we will be doing in the future, but uh, for sure, Maybe we won't be cooperators, but uh, for sure, these cooperative values uh, will be with us forever. And uh, uh, I think that this at the end was one of the most important uh, uh, impact in the sense of what means cooperative learning, no? that really empowering uh, people to face life uh, in a cooperative way instead of a competitive way. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it seems to me that really it's about um, the balance of how a cooperation of people with a particular intention discuss. Oh. We lost her. Lost her, yeah. yes. Um, that's well, very we, sad. Can well, you Nicole, hear me? Nicole, we got, we got the last word we got was a balance between. Okay, the then if you can hear me again, then. Yes, um, yes. That's great. Um, so I was going to ask Christian because, in fact, all the um, initiatives that you had in your EcoP project showed um, particularly um, high level of awareness of a cooperative type of enterprise. Um, hearing what Joanna and what Sarah have said, how would you see the major factors in education, in learning cooperativeness that contribute to a continued cooperation? Um, well, to a continued well, skills uh, is just one component. Uh, okay, students are learning a set of skills, and you could list them. Um, a very tangible skills that are needed to to run a cooperative or contribute in in one way or another. But uh, a core component is also this awareness um, awareness element. And let me just elaborate a bit a bit further on that. So, we all go to high school for how many years? It's uh, 12 years on average. And then some of us go to university, uh, maybe for three years, um, uh, maybe for seven, whatever it is. But where do we hear about cooperatives in all of those years of education, right? Normally in high school, we would hear about co-ops perhaps in a history class somewhere around eighth grade, ninth grade, maybe for uh, one hour <laughs> maximum. It's not more than a footnote about cooperatives, right? If you're in university, um, let's say you're a business student, business school, um, probably you don't hear anything about co-ops normally, uh, unless you take an economic history course, which is usually um, optional. And there, maybe again, it's it's just a, just a small footnote about cooperatives. So, so this rather little, small exposure to co-ops is is not enough um, for us um, uh, to instill an awareness uh, of the co-op model in students, uh, especially if we hope that maybe one day some of those students, only a small fraction, um, uh, goes on to actually become an entrepreneur one way or another and um, be active in the establishment of a co-op um, or, or take some proactive role. So, so awareness building is really central 
um, central to, to promoting uh, co-ops in, in the long run. And also this, this element of getting um, people involved and the grassroots element, which I think is central to, to the topic of your, uh, of new cooperativism. Um, and Nico, we didn't look specifically at new cooperativism. We did not distinguish, but I felt that there was a lot in this grassroots element uh, and a great example, I know I'm running out of time, but we, we saw these uh, student cooperatives where students, high school students, really took the initiative and sat down together and said, we want to do something. We want a more sustainable solution in our high school here locally, or we want to eat uh, um, something very healthy and fresh during our uh, school breaks. So um, there was this one uh, student cooperative that, um, that was cited as a, also a good practice. Um, uh, it was a fruit cup um, uh, student co-op where students got together and, and, um, and arranged a small business to produce fruit cups, essentially fruits cut freshly, and those were sold in, in the schools and then also to the wider community. So, so this is where you have that element that involved also the local community, local businesses, the parents, and so on. Um, so I think you see that reflected uh, there. Okay, so maybe we underestimating young people in their ability and wish, in fact, to um, to do business in a different way, to do it more cooperatively, to live a future that we possibly have forgotten about because we have grown so old. Okay. Um, I think, Rory, uh, we could Time possibly go into breakout groups now. Yes. And please remember, your breakout group is to generate questions for the general discussion. So possibly I'm, the breakout group can yeah. only be 10 minutes, 12 minutes. That would probably no, no, be. I think it can, it, we can afford to have 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay. When, when you come back, there'll be about 20 minutes where you the floor is yours so you can you can comment as well as uh, ask questions what we really want is to hear the conversation that takes place between participants rather than between panelists so we're interested in in your um your thoughts um and the the other thing i just say in in your breakout rooms is there anything different about learning for new cooperativism than there has been you know the tradition traditional way of learning about co-ops as well so if we think about that. All right, I will, I will create breakout rooms and panelists, uh, facilitators just reject the invitation. So the rest of you should end up in two rooms. Okay, and we'll create three. Using the time before we get back, Sarah. <laughs> um, Sarah's back. Christian, can I ask you, I've wrote you in my email address on the chat room. Could you please send me some information about these students' cooperatives you were talking about just right now, just after after the meeting, okay? Yes, um, yes. And in fact, uh, the student cooperatives, you mean the, not the program, but really the student co-op? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. the best way you can find this is if you, if you go to, uh, you Google eCoop Good Practice Guide, okay? Oh, okay. Okay. Good. To the to the ECOP um, website, and there under downloads, you can download the ECOP Good Practice Guide. There's other documents also for the ECOP Good Practice Guide. Okay. And there, okay. In the high school programs we mentioned, there's some of these examples, like the fruit cup example, is in the retirement program. Fühler Genossenschaften. You see it there. Okay. Great. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah. If you've got subsequent questions that you want to ask, I've certainly got um, yes. one, one clarification I'd like to. Yeah, ask please then do start, Rory. Yeah, it, it's it's really. Um, I mean, there's clearly a lot of education about about how you can get people interested in co-ops. Um, I was very interested in Joanna what you were saying about the new co-ops that don't really fit into the the old category. Um, so in, in, in new cooperativism, one of the dimensions that we've identified is, is a strong orientation towards multi-stakeholding. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. that seems to be true in food co-ops as, as, as well as digital co-ops and yeah. places like that. Um, and the other thing is, is this, this, this you know, sort of flat egalitarian culture that Marcelo has discovered in South America. Um, and therefore... How, how does learning take place in a flatter, more egalitarian culture? Um, I, I think there's a lot in education about cooperation, uh, although we don't call it about co-ops. You know, so uh, so I'm just wondering 
what in your understanding of educational theory and, and practice of education is particularly good to foster multi understanding of multi-stakeholding and uh, a more egalitarian culture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would say there are two aspects. The first one is that uh, these groups that decide to create a, a business together, they don't always have that much awareness that they are creating business. There are so much about values yes. and principles and that we cooperate together, yes. that we come together. And that's great because it's a huge basis. Mm -hmm. But then they challenge business decisions. And when we talk about the egalitarian culture, in an association of people that want that want to, uh, I don't know, make some ecological promotion together or, you know, make protest or whatever. Well, it, we go with these values. I mean, it's enough. But when you decide about doing business together, sometimes it's, it's very important to know that the business decisions, when they are taken in an egalitarian uh, organization, they are even much more complicated and difficult than in the hierarchic organization. And I think that's one of the main challenges. So this business education, financial education, and uh, let's say raising awareness with about the consequences of different decisions take, taken by these groups. So th did, did any of you find any organizations that you've worked with who've got particularly yeah. good ways of collaborating in complex Exactly. Decisions? Yeah. Exactly. If I can contribute yeah. about this discussion. Um, well, I think the best story that we documented in uh, this regard is uh, the uh, Cheeseboard Collective uh, in uh, California, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing story that has uh, more than 50 years. So it's, uh, <laughs> they are doing a great job in terms of business um, uh, with 1 million turnover. So it's a very huge uh, organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the interesting part is that they have a totally flat management and yeah. they have always been like that since yes. the beginning. Uh, this means that they had to innovate. That's to me the key part of the discussion because uh, when we find something different, it's uh, it's interesting to see how they've done. And, uh, and very often they've done without being aware that they were creating innovation. Uh, this to what say, did they do? Instance, this what for did they instance, do? yes, yeah. exactly, is because for them it was absolutely normal to have uh, an external facilitator in that decision making process. So right. basically, they are organizing committee, and during uh, um, during meetings, they usually have uh, these external hire facilitators. So it's not a member, so it's not taking the decision, yes. and uh, um, facilitate the group so they can take the best decision for the group. And this is basically what means a suggestion for cooperatives to hire sociologists. That is not something mm -hmm. that uh, if you go to the next cop that you meet uh, around the corner, they would uh, immediately understand the reason why. But uh, uh, this was their way to innovate, um, to continue in this purpose, that's adherence to values, no? Uh, since the very beginning, but uh, in a very business-oriented way. Um, mm -hmm. If I can just say, for instance, I mean, uh, when we have worked with Dobje, um, of course, uh, they have a uh, strong uh, value and, and principle uh, uh, and interest in uh, what they do. But uh, our, our understanding is that they had, uh, they're struggling, of course, but sometimes the bottlenecks might be a different level. Mm -hmm. For instance, for them, they, 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 what, what we learned from them is this bottleneck because of uh, uh, exactly the fact they are not registered and be as an association, mm -hmm. they cannot uh, reinvest. And this is uh, absolutely a big limitation for them to develop as a proper business. Yeah. So um, it was very interesting to learn this because uh, in terms of a uh, uh, model, uh, it's very clear in their mind, you know, this, uh, the fact that uh, they volunteer, they have this shift and they volunteer in the logistics doesn't mean uh, that uh, the world picture actually has a very clear scheme mm -hmm. in terms of business. 
Um, but that exactly, you know, when we talk about new cooperatives, that was a, was a big challenge for them to develop further and reinvest and then be sustainable as a business. Yeah. So um, just just to, to share some some thoughts. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my uh, observation is very close to yours that um, high value and principle based groups frequently um, take a longer time to actually decide at what point they want to become professional, at, at what point they want to register, at what point they want to have a business plan, at what point they want to go for external finance, etc. Um, the other side, if we turn this around, is that um, cooperativism isn't just lived at the basis of having a set of rules, statutes or uh, uh, business plans. It is also lived in the business itself. In other words, egalitarian structures also means you look at your salary structures, you look at your working times, you look at responsibility and how it's shared, etc. Um, what are your observations in these learning settings? And I mean learning settings with adults and with um, pupils and students um, in regard to their own self-definition of cooperativism, because frequently when, say, a, a cooperative federation or an international organization wants to inspire cooperative businesses, they tell them, oh, it's very easy. Yeah, we have a model statute, you can go. It's almost a doubling of the old-fashioned uh, cooperativism where the federation hands out model statutes to um, applicants. Um, whilst the other way around means that you make rules that don't all end in the statute. Some of them have to do with who has what workspace, when do you begin to work, when do you end, what customers do you sell to, et cetera. What are your, your experience in regard to um, the self-definition of what cooperative business is in, in comparison, in, in, in differentiation from other types of businesses? I mean, may, may I reply? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all this is very interesting because I just came back from a training with FAO with the cooperators in Ukraine that have this bad legacy of uh, costs and uh, top-down yes. cooperatives. Yeah. And, um, and we had a, a big challenge ahead because uh, the idea they wanted us to support them in business development. But uh, first of all, that was not uh, clear at all for them what meant being cooperators. And um, um, and was very interesting to see uh, how um, strengthening the uh, co identity is not just because of the values, but because if you have uh, the main problem is passive membership. When uh, members uh, are committed and loyal and know what they are doing, then uh, they contribute to develop the business. Um, so basically, this was uh, we found that this for us was interesting. See, this as an entry point then to to work with them on all the topics. But I would say that uh, to me, at least uh, in uh, the experience of the cooperatives that we have uh, met so far, this is a really a key point because uh, um, if you have uh, uh, members that are there just as employees, um, they will not be committed to develop the business, and uh, so. At the end, we should be a business like uh, any others that can be called cooperatives, but would be as any other. That is not a problem. It should be just called differently. So to me, the key point is there. When uh, you have, so the values and principles are not good as, as such, or, or just because you can uh, tick a list that is good for the audit uh, when it comes to assess you, but it's because this turn into motivated and committed leadership. Mm -hmm. To me, that's mm -hmm. at least what we found as a... Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we have this experience with the pupils. They identify so highly with their cooperative. Um, but then from the type, it's rather a worker cooperative. Yeah, pupils cooperatives are all, all workers. So coming back to so what Rory asked, Reduces, yeah. Yeah. you have a setup in many new cooperatives that is a multi-stakeholder cooperative. And so the different groups have different interests in what this co-op must benefit them how I mean, I, can I could, I could what, what type of cooperative yeah. learning has to happen so that your spirit is still one of high identification even though you're coming from different angles to cooperating i could probably share experience on on decision making in multi-stakeholder co-op so um 
I mean, most of this has been done, you know, pioneered with pupils and cooperators at conferences, but what we're doing is, is setting out protocols for other multi-stakeholder co-ops that are forming. And when we, when we first experimented, we would put them in their own groups and get them to, to discuss a decision, and then they would vote individually. I mean, what actually happened is they would decide as a group how to vote. So what we then started doing was mixing um, the different member groups up. So they would discuss initially in their own groups, then they would discuss in a mixed group. And discussing in a mixed group was, was highly productive because um, they would then get proper exposure to the positions or the attitudes of people who have a different connection to the co-op. Um, and sometimes we will then put them back in their own groups, but actually it's better, we, th we think it's better that they take their vote when they haven't returned to their own groups. So that, that then they're not sort of, their, their independence of thought I think is at its highest when they've had a discussion in their own group and a discussion in a mixed group and then, then, they, then they get asked to vote on a proposal. Um, and then there's a European project where, you know, the whole host of techniques that people use in development work and in um, learning situations like, um, I don't know if you've come across open space technology and action groups and World Cafe. Uh, World Cafe is great, again, for a multi-stakeholder setting, as, as is open space, because people are not tied to their own groups, they navigate around and mix with people from other groups. But the one that we've really um, found productive because it actually leads to decisions is something called OPERA, which is a five stage process. I think Nicole, you went through this when we were in um, yes. Marseille, didn't you? Yes. So you have to go through five steps and the last step is having voted on what you want to prioritize. You then have to sort out how you're going to action it, You know how you're going to um, categorize it and, 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 and uh, organize activities to pursue it. Um, but it's, it's, it's highly participative and everybody gets involved and, and it can cope with the multi-stakeholder mm. setting. Yeah. yeah, I was driving at this because in fact, I think that um, when I started to study cooperatives long, long, long time ago, um, we uh, started to um, on, on very tightly knit cooperatives like Kibbutzim and um, several ideologically and um, uh, ethically based uh, type of cooperatives. And the observation we had was the one that um, Sarah just said, they usually had either a um, abstract uh, instance outside of their group, which gave them some of the basic rules, or they had an external coach, stroke moderator, stroke uh, resource external person. Coach, I think yeah? Yeah. So, and it's this third variation of um, getting a group to accept or to practice certain uh, participatory uh, methodologies that can actually lead to a similar type of effect without having spirituality, without having the external coach. Um, maybe the coach is there to begin to teach them or to make them use a particular methodology, but then he or she can retract and this methodology can be explored even further and developed even further for the group. I think that's a very important part um, of this. And we can see this even in the, in the pupils cooperatives that the teachers are in fact, educated to use such methodologies. And as long as the teacher accepts the role of not being influential, but being just a resource person, standing on the sideline until his or her coaching um, role is needed. And apart from that, perhaps being a good observer, being able to actually watch the group dynamics as much as the learning on an individual level, then that teacher can actually let the group decide and let the group um, produce and let the group find its own rules. And only at certain points, he or she will offer them a new methodology to actually come to a decision. So you can do this with adults, but you can do this with pupils. And I was asking myself, well, we have all these fantastically trained teachers who can do this if they understand their role properly, they are perfectly equipped to do this. But have we got any kind of analogy, any kind of pendant um, for adult groups? And I see, for example, in the housing sector in Germany, new housing type of cooperatives develop with multi-generational living, et cetera. And um, there, the housing cooperative federations have actually not got the staff to do this. 
but local governments who are initiating housing groups to use spaces that otherwise would not be sensibly usable, that may be um, uh, uh, military um, areas in a town, or that may be a high density area of old buildings that have not been renovated, etc. They sometimes actually employ such coaches, such um, external uh, coaches, and their brief is not to be a coach forever. Their brief is to actually enable the group to adopt certain moderation techniques um, to actually do this on a continuing basis. And I'd like to know from your point of view, have you seen any other such sources to actually bring in uh, such participatory uh, technology into group dynamics, into such new cooperatives? I'd be particularly interested in Christian, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the education programs, whether they're teaching these participatory management techniques as part of co-op curricula or not. Yeah. Um, I would think that would be something um, you would find more in university-based programs. So it's not happening um, in high schools. Well, also in high schools. Now that I that I think about it, I remember that one of the student co-op programs where students actually started a real co-op, not a simulated one, yes. but a, a yeah. real one. I remember that there was also, yes, there was, there was, I remember it now. <laughs> there was uh, student co-ops that received mentors that came in from the local community and they came from, from businesses or nonprofit organizations uh, in town that were somehow linked to whatever theme the student co-op was working on. But I remember it was something that went over time. It was not just uh, like a, a one day coaching, maybe that was the beginning, but then maybe once a month, there was some kind of follow-up uh, over time. There was that component. Yeah. And I guess also that these more experienced um, coaches uh, uh, would also train the co-op leaders to, um, to find patterns to manage, you know, these processes on their own. Mm -hmm. So capacity building uh, would be part of it, yeah. What about you, Joanna? Well, what, what, what I can recall, I don't know, like, uh, many programs concerning the participatory techniques, at, although it's one of my, our main, main, uh, main uh, reflections after today that I should... Um, uh, let's say, uh, study that and introduce more of that uh, to our trainings. But what we were doing for many years is that one of, well, we will deliver, deliver trainings to, to cooperators. Uh, for instance, on management or on communication. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, uh, well, we, we shouldn't talk about communication itself, but we should talk about communication in the cooperative. Mm -hmm. So what we were doing is we had, before each training, we had like, a, 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 let's say full work with the, with the trainer, that when he or she prepared a case, a case studies on communication, mm -hmm. that, that were real situation from cooperatives, for mm. instance, from general assemblies, mm. from the meetings between uh, supervisory board and the management board. And we were recalling all the difficult situations that ha we had in mind that were actually going on in the cooperatives before. Uh, to put that into the, this best cases, uh, to, to use them during that trainings. So they had to figure out what communication techniques they should use to solve the, the real problem of a real cooperative. So this was also much better for them to really connect the knowledge they get during the training to their real life, because it's one of the main challenges of the trainings that you can, you can, uh, you can get the knowledge or skills during the training, but then it's really difficult to <laughs> implement them at, in the real life. So this was one of the things that we were trying to do to really connect the real life with the knowledge they, um, they get during the training so that they can really get skills in that process. Okay. So that, one of the I, things I was just thinking is um, there was a question. Left. 
was a question in the chat yeah. and I'd like to pose this again to Sarah because um, we can learn this from a coach who comes in and practices this with us. Do you believe we could also learn more participatory methods for a group from watching videos? So I usually, as a trainer, uh, I usually participatory methods. Uh, is um, really where people, I, I mean, the philosophy that we, uh, we follow is the Freire pedagogy. I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, the concept is yes. that the learner is not a passive uh, yes. beneficiary of knowledge. Yes. Uh, it's not an empty shell to uh, fill of knowledge, okay. but is a uh, active participants. And um, by the way, I'm, uh, I'm about to close mm -hmm. the other room, so people will start right. back right. in. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Well, we'll continue. <laughs> yes, we've, right. got six, we've got sixty seconds, and then boom. So, no, do we do we now bundle questions? Um, no, we let we give the floor to the okay. participants okay. in the in the other rooms. Let them let them have a conversation, um, and hopefully, questions will emerge. There were some questions left by Catalina before she left. Yes, uh, this is what yeah. I was referring to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which they were they were good questions. If, uh, yes, very much so. Okay. So here, come back, yeah. Right, so you're, you're effectively interviewing the participants now, Nicole. <laughs> yes, the participants have all come back from their breakout uh, group and hopefully um, developed a few questions, comments, subjects that they would like to go in depth into. Right, there's still a few um, come back. There's still uh, I, Grant, uh, oh. Stephen, Ursula and Anna. Ah, okay. So we're not ready yet. So we'll right, wait right, and right, here they are. Here they are. can sketch a few from each group so that we can see um, maybe there are some parallel or similar questions from the different groups so we can answer those together. Yeah. Are we right, all so back? Group, so let me tell you who was in group. Uh, so the first group mm -hmm. was Anna, Stephen and Ursula. Okay. So. Okay, um, you speak let's, let's take turns. Shall we start with group one, then one question from group two, and then one from group uh, or, three? Or just, so comments. We, or just comments. Yeah, or comments, yeah. So group one, Anna, Stephen, or Ursula, who, uh, what have you uh, that you want to ask to comment on, to go into depth on? Yeah, thanks, Nicole. I'm really interested in what is the relationship with sort of existing co-ops? and the sort of attempt for new cooperative forms. Mm. Okay. One of the panelists, is there anyone of you who would want to venture an answer on this one? No, well, not the panelists. The panelists don't speak for the next 20 okay. minutes. Yeah. Oh, oh, so, oh. Um, it's, it's oh. participants now. So, I mean, Steve, how's learning going on in BME? <laughs> we were having a good chat about this actually in fair shares and, and multi-stakeholder um, and also uh, the uh, interesting news conscious this is recording so I'll describe it as interesting news that the largest consumer co-op in the UK today has announced a partnership with Amazon um, so you know, we did have a good discussion about new cooperativism and, and the future um, and returning to proper member control um, and education is key to all of that so uh, um, we did have a good discussion, but to answer your question, Rory, since, mm. since you asked, we, we, we've uh, implemented sociocracy mm. um, and, and it's very early days, but that's been a resounding success. Um, and it's really helped people to understand, um, uh, just to explain for the, the rest of the audience that we converted to a worker co-op um, last year, almost a year ago, actually, so September 28th. Um, and for most of the employees, 36 of us, most of us, um, it kind of just happened that you know there wasn't an awful lot of involvement there was no money that was required by the employees so uh, so it's been a bit of an education process as we go forward understanding in more detail the different types of co-ops um it, why we're a worker co-op and actually a key element is actually control so it's not just member control at an agm once a year you know it's regular we've delegated authority from the board down to the management team down to circles um, do and so need, individuals. Yeah, do, do people need a, an explanation of sociocracy? A, well, we've actually, and, and I would recommend, personally, I'd recommend this to a lot of people, um, we've taken a subset of sociocracy to begin with, 
which is really just you have circles that, that have a, a responsibility for areas. And um, these circles start with no authority. They work at what authority they need. It's a bit like growing up. They work at what authority they need. They request it from the parent and the parent delegates that authority. And that's been a tremendous success. Um, and that's really starting to grow. People are really starting to understand the cooperative and why, why we exist. And now we have some of the team members that are moving into, into education themselves, studying at uh, St. Mary's University, like I am, the Master's in Cooperative Management. Um, so yeah, sociocracy, I would, uh, to answer your question, um, early days, but it is, it's certainly looking very good. Mm -hmm. So, Anna, does that uh, answer more or less your point or your question? It does, but I'm very keen to hear what other people here might have to say. Right, your questions, right. But also, okay. maybe so, there are other questions. Any too. other ideas, observations um, that would relate to this question? Main difference between old and new cops um, and what we need to learn for it? So it's not so much about the main difference, it's about the nature of the relationship between the two. Ah, what okay. were you discussing? Because just, just, you know, you've had your discussion that nothing goes on the record except what you bring back to us. So we, right. unless you tell us what you were discussing and what the points of debate are, that then uh, we, we have no knowledge of, of what was behind the question. Yeah. So how did you get to that question? I got to that question, I suppose, through personal experience of uh, being involved in multi-stakeholder forms and trying to create those and being told by what I would see as the mainstream movement is, no, 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 that is not the way to go. So I'm very interested when people are talking about lots of new cooperativism forms and there are existing cops. Is there any relationship? What's it right. like? Okay. Can we build on it? Yeah. Mm. Do, should we move to group two? Yes, we, let's move Gillian, to group Gillian, two. Is yeah, there Gillian, any? Gillian Grant and Hazel. Okay, so um, uh, you just want one question at the moment, is that right? Well, com comments, we want, we want your, what you were talking about and, and your commentary of what- Okay, so, so we, would, we talked about um, a number of things. One, one is about the nature of cognitive learning itself. What is it? Um, and um, so not so much, um, of course, in part, it's learning about co-ops um, and it's learning how to be a co-op, to be a cooperator. Um, but it's also about the nature of the learning itself. So I think this was our question, really, is um, uh, what kind of learning is positive learning? I guess we were seeing it as forms of collaborative learning. Um, and that, that in turn leads to other kinds of questions like about learning between cooperatives. So collaborative learning in a, in a school or higher education setting or in a formal learning session, se setting could take particular forms um, uh, and probably involve a lot of peer group learning. Um, but when you take it kind of beyond that into learning between cooperatives, um, how, it, how can it be done and how can it be done better? And, and a particular note being that um, the, cons the consumer movement, which is you know, substantial, um, uh, certainly in the UK, how can it engage with other types of cooperatives? and learn from other types of cooperatives. So, so there's a kind of, you know, another aspect to learning here. So um, how can it learn from about sociocracy, for example? How could it use it? Um, so, so there are questions of that kind coming up. I don't know if Gillian wants to add anything to what I've said. Okay, thank you. Did you have any answers to that query or that, you know, is there, is there about the, it's because it kind of builds on Anna's question, doesn't it? I don't think we have answers, um, uh, up to, certainly not to the second question. I think I've probably got personally a better handle on the first question about collaborative learning 
um, just because I work in education. But it's um, uh, but I, I was I was interested that not a lot was said about that as a methodology, as a learning mm -hmm. methodology mm -hmm. in the initial presentation. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there anyone else coming from the educational field in our group? Yes, in in, in room three we've got George uh, and Raphael, both uh, uh, university based or. Uh, higher education sector based maybe you would want to come in on um cooperative yeah. learning collaborative learning yeah. so the room, room three was george ken martin and Raphael. um i can start rory if you want so we basically um started the discussion um with this question that you had asked with the new values and i think we kind of <clears throat> thought it's maybe more a question of um new expressions of, um, of values mm -hmm. or shifting priorities, you know, that are important for students, housing, delivery services, these kind of different topics. So we discussed those a little bit and thought that these are important to attract also students to, um, um, we, had, we had the topic that often maybe the millennial values are quite close to cooperatives, but they don't know about the opportunities. So this awareness point that I think, um, sorry, I forgot the name. Chris, Christian, um, if I heard properly, um, made. So that's definitely, I'm at a business school, so that's definitely relevant there, um, that students just don't know about it. And we're right now trying to work on a guide for our students. So we are thinking what's the best way to reach out to them, right? To have this awareness point there. And so I'm curious here to learn about this. Um, but um, George also raised the question, if anyone worked on the question, if, students who were um, taking courses on cooperatives as pupils or as students afterwards are engaged in cooperative education. So this is just a question we had, if there anyone studied that. And the other one was for the Polish um, program, if this is actually government supported or if it's a bottom up initiative, just how it works. I, um, I don't know if that was really the, all the points, but that's sort of what I remember right now. <laughs> and that was really for the pupils cooperatives in Poland, oh, how, how they resource, how that program is resourced. Mm. Maybe we can start with this. It's a very practical question, isn't it, Jana? Okay. So I would say it's totally not supported by the government <laughs> because, uh, as I told you before, uh, we are for many years now we are fighting for the legal, legal regulation um, it's totally bottom up i think and we last year we were preparing a research paper for the ministry of uh, of labor and social affairs this is actually the only ministry uh, in the government that really um, is involved in promoting that uh, uh, that issue, that that kind of initiatives, because it's involved in the social economy sector, and uh, well, so pupils cooperatives are well, workers cooperatives, uh, disabled people cooperatives are part of the social economy sector in Poland. We are supporting for many years pupils cooperative movement. So, uh, like. The men, this is the only ministry which actually uh, feels the importance of, of that kind of school initiatives. Uh, but there is no money from the government going down. It's totally bottom up. And I think that the only reason why the uh, Pupis Cooperative still exists despite of the support of the Foundation for Students Cooperatives or the unions like ours, but the main reasons are teachers. Mm -hmm. These are the key success factors that this movement still exists in Poland because these teachers, they don't get any ad additional salary. They do it uh, totally voluntary after the work they do already uh, at schools, after doing program, the, you know, the essential program, etc. That's totally voluntary. They devote their time in the afternoons, in the weekends to, to take these, uh, these students to, um, to compete in different content, contents, for instance, like uh, organized by the foundation. So it's totally bottom up. And what we are trying to do is to really help them in many different ways 
and maybe finally we will get the government, the, you know, the nation uh, support for it, but we are still fighting for it. It's mm -hmm. totally bottom up mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. If you want to have new ideas on how to finance a pupil cooperative system, um, we can talk about this because in Germany it's actually a tandem finance or by the state and um, the cooperative federations and still the product is uh, new to both of them. It's an innovative product basically for both of them. Um, well, we will do for sure because we already <laughs> contacted you on that. <laughs> okay, okay. So I gave you a link, I think, to the Syriac publication. Yes, yes, um, thank you. But we can go into more in depth. Yeah. But if anyone else wants to know about how it was done here. Um, in fact, I would like to take up the other question that came from the group three. Um, that's uh, the long-term effects. Are there pupils or students that in the long run, after having left university, having left school, would actually tend to want to start co-ops? Um, I can only speak from the small um, German perspective and we don't have any research on this as yet. I was trying very hard to convince um, possible funders uh, to actually get back to um, students and pupils who have gone through such programs because we do have a very close um, link with, with the schools. But what I can tell you is that informally we get the information that many schools find that a lot of their alumni are in fact uh, pupils who have been in the uh, pupils cooperative before that those are their most faithful alumni and they come back after two years four years 10 years um, having been to school having left school and they account that part of the most impressive part of their school education was this cooperative setup so even if they don't start their own cooperative um, they go out into the working world with a different kind of confidence in regard to um, uh, self-employment, but also in regard to being an employee who has rights and who can go into project work or who can go into an organization and actually stand up for themselves in a way. Um, and that brings me back to cooperative learning. Cooperative learning is something which is recognized by educational science, as, as, as Hazel has said, as a, as a very specific type of pedagogic of, of approach to acquiring um, competences, skills, attitudes. Um, but it demands a lot of teachers, Hazel. Would, would you agree with this? Um, the teachers that we, we worked with and we encouraged to actually really go into situated cooperative learning um, have to um, undergo a complete change of role they are being trained to be resource persons to come back responsibility to the group. We lost you for about 20 seconds. Um, the role of the teacher in cooperative learning is means he, he gives responsibility more or less entirely to the students and sets the frame and encourages them to reflect upon their learning situation and what they gained out of it. That's a completely different role to what most teachers in Germany would have been prepared for in their own teachers training. Would you agree with this? Is this something that you find in other countries as well? Who are you asking? I'm asking Hazel because she comes right, from the okay. educational sector. <laughs> I, wasn't sure, I wasn't sure if you're asking me or, the, or yes. all of us. Um, I, yeah, it, 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 it's definitely definitely a different way of um, uh, enabling learning to happen. Um, that's for sure, um, because the teacher themselves has to, you know, the teachers themselves have to learn and rethink how they do things. Um, but it 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 isn't. I, I don't feel it's an all or nothing approach, actually, um, that there are, you know, different ways in which teachers can both kind of perform their traditional roles as well as um, enable peer to peer learning um, and setting up a frame so you can, you know, combine these things. Um, I mean, I'm just talking from a personal point of view here. Um, so, but um, I, I I, th I, th I think uh, one of the things that we were talking a bit about in, in the group, or, group or, the, or the maybe that I, I was saying is that everybody comes to a learning situation with knowledge. It's, it's not like everybody's a blank sheet. And therefore, that everybody brings something. 
and and everybody can also start to reflect on their own backgrounds and experiences and um anew i mean uh, so actually reflecting on that might um enable them to think about okay so i learned this from doing that but how did that how did that happen and uh how, what has that done for me in terms of my uh, approach to cooperation or, or to being a corporate cooperator um and it, it isn't that um, there's, uh, I was interested in the conversation earlier about, you know, this is the way to do co-ops, that is not the way to do co-ops. So, uh, and of course, what we're talking about is in fact, um, people uh, finding new ways of doing, uh, of, of being a cooperator. It, it isn't all set in stone. So, so people can build on experiences they've had in the past, which may not be pure cooperating um, uh, in, in a traditional sense. That's also good because they're bringing something that's a bit different and that people can think about. Um, so I'm, I'm all for kind of learning from difference, really, learning from different experiences and people having different life histories and narratives to tell about what they do, um, as well as different you know, narratives in textbooks. I mean, it's, uh, so there's, um, th th there's a lot of stuff here, but yes, I think you're right, Nicole, that, that um, it's quite important there, therefore, for how the facilitators or teachers or trainers or whoever they are, are themselves taught and trained and how they understand what they're doing, what their role is. Yeah, I'm getting signs from Rory that we must now come to our final discussion of um, or reflection of the panelists. Um, so perhaps, of yeah. yeah, just a couple Is that of right? each, I think. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we could start with those open issues. Maybe the panelists could give an impression as to what they've taken on board, what they want to reconsider, what they think our main points about improving or uh, developing towards a new type of cooperativism using learning settings of any kind. Yeah. Um, Can I just a few words, Nicole? Yes, please. Um, when uh, we um, uh, interviewed uh, uh, Professor De Velter, he told us, uh, you all know Professor De Velter, I'm sure, he told us that the future of cooperative movement uh, is in a cooperative learning since early age. Um, so learn people, teach people to uh, be co to cooperate and not compete. Um, and uh, I would like, and I totally agree. Yeah, I think it's a sum up a bit of the discussion. But uh, um, also, uh, we were saying before, I was sharing before the pedagogical approach of Freire that we are inspire a lot in our work, uh, intending that people are not passive beneficiary of any knowledge, even the technical knowledge, knowledge how to be a cooperator. Um, so the key, I saw a comment in the chat, and this is something that I totally agree, is about uh, inspiring people, and what Isa was saying as well, of creating their own way, innovative way to set up. And that basically, if a new form of cooperative, we are observing new form of cooperatives, is exactly because some communities came together and without any preconceived knowledge, they inspired themselves about how to transform their lives and their communities. And uh, probably these participatory methods of learning from each other, because at the end, the participatory method is this, that I learn from you, you learn from me, and we create something new, probably is a bit at the heart of, uh, to me, of the process. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. That's already kind of a final statement from you. Uh, Joanna, what, what are you taking with? What's in your bag from the seminar? Yeah. Well, my huge reflection after today's seminar is that uh, we are actually, um, we have a challenge to uh, because the mm, mm, there was a, a question about the relations between new cooperativism and new cooperative types and the old I, I wouldn't say old I would say traditional one and I think that uh, in Poland for instance the new types of cooperatives these uh, these groups that are, that are entering cooperative world they really want to learn from the traditional movement. But for the traditional movement, it's a huge challenge to transform this knowledge uh, and to, to put it in a way where we 
teach about, about how to run an enterprise, but in the language uh, that these people will understand, but also in the way that this way of doing business, cooperative business today will fit into the today's world. That is totally different than the one that we uh, we had when the the traditional cooperatives were born at the time. So this is the challenge of combining the traditional cooperative movement with the modern world and with the new cooperatives, actually. And I think it's uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, tools today that we could uh, incorporate, and I hope. Uh, we will have time after some years to come back and recall that and uh, and some new experiences to share. Thank you. That sounds um, like a lot of work ahead, but a very promising type of initiative. Yeah. Christian, what have you benefited, taken with you? What would you like to focus on? Yes, I mean, I understood once again that, um, as I said, there's not that one perfect uh, educational initiative, but it's rather that there are, are many. And also, uh, and this is the point I want to hit, is that when you have a cooperative and you look at the leaders and uh, the persons involved in the shaping of the co-op, they all have different educational backgrounds. And, and it's this mix that comes together. If they all were exposed to the best program in the world, if there's this top program for co-op that they all would participate in, then that would mean they all have the same educational background and, and this provides less value. It's better to have this very wide range of educational experiences and people come together and are not afraid of sharing their inputs. And then I think that is when the best uh, the best solutions come out and, and, um, and, and that is the best use of, of all of those educational backgrounds for the benefit of the cooperative. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right. And I think um, the interesting thing is um, talking of this thing about developing cooperativism. In our evaluations, we saw that those 12, 13 year old kids are basically cooperativists. Mm -hmm. We make them capitalists. Yeah. We make them compete. We make them develop standards that um, they are looking to achieve that might be competitive with the others. Um, in fact, if we were to support their um, initiative of trying to convince others, getting them on board, making them do things, negotiating the rules, etc., would probably end up with students entering university that would be far less competitive. And on top of that, if I now consider how this COVID-19 um, pandemic has brought students and pupils into isolation and how self-centered they have to have become. I mean, I, I've witnessed this with my first um, in-person seminars, then um, I am more than ever convinced that this is the road to go. Um, in whatever form, combination of giving input, being a coach, uh, situative to, uh, teaching, cooperative learning, whatever. And I really am looking forward to practicing more of um, sociography and um, practicing more of opera and practicing more of the other uh, participatory um, methods with children, students and adults, because I believe that this will probably be the key to changing our world in an economic way in, in, in a different direction. But it needs many of us. So great that you have been all in a way multipliers to this. And I'm looking forward to the varied results of um, this will have in regard to developing cooperativism further. Thanks very much for your participation.